if you've got your Bibles, turn to Revelation 14. If you've not got a Bible and you want one, then there should be one in the pew pocket in front of you. You can take that. Nobody will stop you doing that. And the, the other one can take it out. And if you've got your journals, you're going to need those this morning. Um, because we've got a lot to get through. Before we get to that, though, thank you. Um, just uh, a couple of little things. First of all, we're coming to the end of our financial year. And uh, as those of you who know, have been around it a little bit, um, as well as Tom has said, I've had the lead on the investment bank for the last nine years. And, and part of my job is to oversee all the budget and the money and the finances and all the exciting things. Uh, but actually, I really enjoy it because it's such a great way of seeing the way that God, in one aspect, is blessing this church with, with finances. Uh, when we started this church, then he only started coming down to Canada in the last year. You may not know that we, we I think we sell over 50,000 reminders on our one-year anniversary, which is really exciting. And uh, many of you are part of that journey. It's just an amazing miracle of how we can actually uh, get the building and buy the building and everything else. But one of the things that we needed is one thing, buying a building, and another thing, paying for it um, afterwards, operationally. And so um, the, the eldership, myself, and the leadership, we prayed and we believed that God had called us to make this step, take this step to buy this building. And we've seen tremendous fruit over the last year. Um, it's been amazing to see what God has been doing. And he's, uh, he's working in marvelous changes and changes in our home and to see all the different different ministries that are happening that we weren't able to do when we were in uh, school. Um, but, uh, but since this time last year, just to give you an idea of how incredible our church has been, this church in particular is downtown, our giving has gone up by around about $250,000 a year. Uh, put that in perspective, we usually were around about the $400,000 mark at the end of the year as we were raising it. So it's been remarkable, and I want to say thank you for that. Lots of that are people who are new in the church uh, as well, and so we do encourage you, if this is your church home, then please uh, be obedient to what the scriptures say and, and give to the work of the house. It's, it's been amazing what we've been able to do. So thank you for that. And we're also, I've just handed over the second, I guess the third step, the third memo now is I own the building of glory. 500,000. So right now we're looking, we've got a, a mortgage of, of $1 million, which, which is a chunk of change, as we say in Britain. And I'm believing that we're going to pay this mortgage down by the end of today. Yeah. Don't say that. You never know. Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's do it. So here, here, here's the thing. It's, uh, we, were, we were blessed to be able to, in no small part, Put down a million dollars in cash. It wasn't actually that far, was it, Ricky? You know, that whole cake thing that everyone goes down and says, I want to put down a million dollars. It wasn't a lot at all. It was really, it wasn't even a big thing. I told them to hand over a large check to get an electric. Um, but the reality is, is that we, we, we are looking at, at the end of uh, our kind of process that we've got with the finance going to have a mortgage of around about $2.7 million. And to put that in perspective, that's our total interest rate for uh, our church. Now, before you, some of you people are like, you want to fix this, I already, I can almost hear it. You're going to hear this interest rate and you're going to go, what? But you've got to remember we're not residential, okay? So our current interest rate, uh, we're going to be paying in the region of about $240,000 a year over the mortgage. So I think there's better ways of using that money to the ministry. And so the reason I'm sharing that is I really want you to join with me in praying that God will provide $2.7 million for us over the next year or so. Now, for some of us in the room, that's going to be like, what? That's just an amazing amount of money. There are other people in the room with connections or whatever it might be that, you, you know what, I just want you to pray and to think and to consider who it might be, even in our city, who'd be interested in hearing more about the work that you're doing and the team are doing and you're doing in this 
Bible and said, can you contribute to help us read this book? They never believed the book, so they never contributed to it. But eventually, God was amazing in the way he took that letter in. He said, do you remember? Who can provide in this way as well? All right, so uh, I just want to let you know that. Um, I am going to be mentioning it more because you never know. One week, Matt is going to be there with Simon the Carpenter opening the Bible. We just don't know what to do with it. You never know. I just spoke to a pastor uh, in the Lower Mainland and uh, a gospel pastor I got to mention last week, and his church has just given $10 million. And I was like, oh, praise the Lord. Just, yeah, we gave, it a, we gave a million away to missionaries like Oprah. You can have a million. You can have a million. Actually, he's a good friend of mine, and we have a good laugh about it. Ten million. And that was from somebody who didn't go to the church. We need to find these people, friends. Hunt them down. I will happily buy them coffee. It's cheap coffee, but I will buy them a coffee. All right, let's, uh, let's turn to Revelation 14. Revelation chapter 14, an incredible passage. It's been a wonderful journey so far through Revelation. Um, in the past, I have joked about people, especially people who like to do CrossFit. Maybe they do CrossFit, are vegan, run marathons, and are triathletes as well. And I kind of joke, I wonder which one of those things they're going to put in their book. You know, because there's just such a, well, I'm a vegan. Oh, I'm a triathlete. And, or I'm a triathlete. You know, oh, I ran up the stairs the other day. No big deal. Or I'm a marathon runner. Oh, yeah, that's great. The thing is, I used to do CrossFit, and so I know what it used to. Everyone's examining my midriff now. I immediately sucked in as soon as I said, I used to do CrossFit. Um, the one thing that impressed me about CrossFit, apart from I used to injure myself all the time, was, was the community. There was an identity tied up with it. And it's the same with the way you eat. It could be keto or vegan or whatever. There's a bit of, a, there's a bit of an identity to it. Marathon running, triathlon, it's all the same thing. There's this identity and unity and morale that comes with being part of something that's bigger than you. And I think it's a shame in our culture where we're so hyper-individualistic that we actually forget that as humans, we really enjoy being part of something bigger than us. That's why, why we love church. And, you know, I was thinking about this and looking at this passage, and this passage is, is almost like a call to a banner. And you might not know what I mean by that, but a banner in medieval times especially was, was something that was used in warfare and um, let me just make sure I've got this right here. I don't know if I did or not. There we go. So a banner would be used in warfare for a number of different reasons. They would actually have banner holders. They were used for forms of communication. So they would turn the banner different colors at different times, and the troops would know what to do. There was an identification, so the soldiers in the midst of war would know who their people were, which is actually really important in the pursuit of the battle, you need to know who to rally to. It also gave morale and inspiration, so the Romans were well known for having banners with eagles on them, which was eventually was copied by the Nazis too. So the, the Romans had the eagles on their banners, and it was to, there for morale and inspiration. And then finally, there was this rallying that they could regroup and organize themselves around a banner. And most interestingly, for those of you who've ever played like paintball or anything like that, or something online, an online game where there's capture the flag, the capture the flag game was actually from capturing your enemy's banner because then you could cause confusion because they would look, the soldiers would look to their banner. And so if you steal it, you could communicate wrongly, you could place it in the wrong place, they would end up rallying in the wrong place, and confusion would ensue. Revelation 14 unfurls a banner for us to rally to, find inspiration from, identification, and instruction. These are the four things that a banner in warfare was used for. 
of Revelation 14 gives us that as a church. It also is a banner of warning to the enemy. The enemy at the time, in, in kind of medieval times, would see a banner and they would be fear that would rise up because they know by looking at the banner what the enemy was going to be doing, who they were going to be, where they were coming from. And so this banner that Revelation 14 controls over us is that warning. This is a wedding book. It's a passage full of wrath and judgment. It actually ends with one of the most gory we could say verses in the Bible. And yet we can draw something that is going to be creating identity and instruction and a place for every Christian to rally to. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to jump in and we're going to go through it verse by verse. And I'm going to very quickly show you what the verse means and hopefully apply some of the larger points. So verse 1, if you've got your Bibles or your app, let's look at it together. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb. And we know Zion is symbolic of, of Christians. The Lamb is Jesus, and with him 144,000. And his name and his Father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like a roar of many waters, like the sound of loud thunder. Okay, so first of all, 144,000, we know from chapter 7 when we studied it, is a complete number. What this speaks to is the complete church, the people of God. It's not an actual 144,000. This speaks to us. We are the army of the Lamb. We are Zion, the new Jerusalem, the new kingdom, the people of God, this completion. And it's an army made up, if you notice, this is the rally, this is what we have in common, with the Father's name written on their forehead. Jesus' name and Father's name. We studied this a few weeks ago, so we know that our thinking is the same, and also our action is the same. That's what brings us uh, in terms of commonality. If you read in Romans chapter 12, it speaks about being transformed by the renewing of our minds. So the way our thinking is, our lives will follow. And as we move into the third verse, we actually see some evidence of this transformed life. So remember, this is speaking to who we are. This is the banner. This is our identity. This is what we are called to. The voice. This is an army of one voice. They are singing a new song. We actually see at the beginning of chapter 15 what that new song is, the song of Moses. But they are singing as one voice. And as I was praying and thinking through this, I felt strongly that it was speaking that to us as a church, as a group, as Christians who are called to Willowpark Church, friends, let's make sure we rally to the same point. We must be united. Know that the enemy does everything he can to bring disunity into our ranks. Now, I'm not going to say that we're always going to be happy with one another, but we are united under one banner, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so we need to be really careful. We need to check our hearts, check our spirits and our attitudes, and we need to be careful that we speak in one voice. What does that look like? Well, I can tell you with all clarity what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like pulling down. It doesn't look like finding problems. What it looks like is building up, encouraging, seeing a, seeing a solution, offering a solution, coming alongside, bearing one another's burdens. We say, oh, doing life together. And I think as a church, I have to say, I've been in ministry for 30 years. I can say with all sincerity, this church does a phenomenal job of bearing one another's burdens. I know more than you do, the pastoral team know the ways in which that happens, in remarkable ways. Ways that it would be inappropriate for me to share because it's sharing other people's stories. But this unity is what makes us strong. One voice singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000. This is a unique calling. Who'd be redeemed? Who are the redeemed? Those who follow Jesus. Those who are following the Lamb. Those who are listening to the roar of the Lion of Judah. Those who are saved by the Lamb and rallying around the gospel. It is these 
who would want to file some stars with good ones because they are virgins. I thought, ah, I thought it's all right. What? So this is being translated in a number of different ways, literally, that in order to be a Christian, you have to be celibate. Hello. That's not us. Okay, secondly, uh, it also is being interpreted that there would be so- soldiers and armies who believe that in order to win a war, they have to be celibate because that will bring God on their side. That's not what it means either. If you look at the context and you look at what the Old Testament says, the Old Testament constantly referred to the people of God as virgins. And idolatry was referred to as adultery. And so what this verse is actually talking about is the people of God are keeping themselves pure. They're following after the things of God because they are the people of God. First Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 14 speaks clearly, there's no temptation that can overtake us. So people of God are marked and rally around the understanding that we have been called to be pure. What does pure mean? It means that we are not intimate with the world, but as we will see in a minute, Babylon. Babylon is representative of the world view, the world order, the way that the world, anything outside of the kingdom of God, sees their life and how to live their life. It's referred to as Babylon. At this point, Rome was Babylon. So being intimate with the thinking and the ways of the world and our culture leads ultimately to defiling yourself. That's what this verse is speaking to. But friends, we have to be careful what we watch. We have to be careful who we flirt with at work. We have to be careful of the sort of you know, we might get kind of um, physical and sort of like emotional flirtation as well. We have to be extremely pure in the way that we use our speech, speaking truth, speaking lies, gossip. These are all just subtle, more obvious ways in which the world, the, 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 the culture, Babylon, draws Christians away from the cause, away from your banner. Come over and stand under this banner. The second thing this verse says is, is that it's to those who follow the Lamb that will be saved. So try it. If we are not common by ourselves, we see again our culture, Babylon, which say, you be you, you be you, no judgment, be a lone ranger, you can do anything you set your mind on, you go. Whereas that is not rallying under a banner together. We need to be together prioritizing the cause of the banner. Mark 8, Jesus himself said, take up your cross and follow the Lamb, follow me. Christians, you need church. You need biblical community. You need to be connected to one another. Whether it's coffee or whether it's in a small group, community group, or in a larger group, you need one another. But you also, you're not called to be a lone ranger. You are called to follow Jesus. And you're also called to follow Jesus with integrity. And in my mind, no lie is true. And in the little wifey stuff, or the little business techniques, the little way in order to get your way over and above somebody else, we have integrity. We find you, we're blameless. How is it that we can say we're blameless? Because we are sheep of Jesus, we're in Jesus, we're in Jesus. How did that help me? Well, then I saw another angel saying, by what you ever help you, not burn your vessel. You see, we can prioritize, we can uh, rally together, we can communicate, we can stand into the banner, we can be blameless, because of the eternal gospel. Because of the eternal. Nothing that you and I do, everything that Jesus Christ has done, He is our King. He is the one who we stand with for every nation and tribe and language and people. You see, one of the things that has leveled against the church over time is that we're inclusive. And yet, you read this verse, it's incredibly inclusive. See, this is not an exclusive club that only a few people are able to join. It actually is to all are welcome. All who believe to every nation and tribe and language and people and just every that God would hear God and give him glory. Ultimately, that is the point. Hear God. Give him glory. Wisdom begins with fearing God. Understanding that there is a God bigger than us. Understanding there's a God holier than us. Understanding that there is nothing that we can do to close that gap in relationship with God. 
Nothing that we can lay on the table is evidence to show that we deserve to be asked to be part of the family. Nothing at all. Fearing God, recognizing that the God you're about to see in the rest of this account is both real and accurate and very much on its way. Dear Pity Glory, when Elijah took the hour of his judgment to come and worship him, he made heaven and earth to see and to bring out of the water. The eternal gospel of Jesus Christ blood and his sacrifice. As we have been singing so beautifully this morning, he is our cornerstone. He is the one who willingly gave his life by his own, he gave up his own life. The only one pure in us, the only one blameless in us to take on the full judgment and wrath of God. Sin hung on him and died with him and then in newness of life he raises again and then says, here, you too can be part of this. Sin, don't just stand in your bond of self, but he's the one that seeks us away from God, hung on the cross with you, died with you, and then rose again. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you far more than any of them that will ever live. No more than any of them. We don't like sin, by the way. We don't, and I spoke about this a few weeks ago, we don't like the rock kind of Christianity. Kind of the binary in and not in. Black and white. Saved and cursed. Sealed and unsealed. And yet the Bible is full of this kind of thing. There's no middle ground. You're either under the banner, actively engaging the banner. Christian, this, this applies to you. You are either under the banner of Christ or you are under the banner of Babylon. There is no middle ground. But can I tell you, if you find yourself drifting around you ultimately will always end up towards Babylon. One of the most exciting parts of uh, our economy in the last 20, 30 years is Corona. And we decided to get both. Sounds terrible, but that's what we did. And I've spoken about this a little bit on Monday. We had two friends of ours who were taking the boat cruise. They also never had owned a boat before. Now, they'd driven a boat, and they had their boat on a, a, a trailer. And so the El Dorado, in all its glory, in the middle of summer, was a place, a divorce spot. I mean, that was just basically our experience, especially with me bobbing around, waiting for Sarah. To, I've told this story before, I won't say it again. Down the cross to stop, call on your phone. But I do remember this. I remember one thing some hardened seafaring person told me once. Because when it gets choppy, and it does get choppy quite fast, point the boat into the wave, because otherwise the water starts to come in. You hear it in the night. Because you can't just drift around in the middle of the lake and expect to stay still. You cannot stand under the banner of Christ and not do anything to stay there. It's never your, your salvation. I don't believe that. I believe in saved, always saved. I really do. No question is whether you're truly saved at the beginning. That's a whole other sermon. But you've got to be active. You always drift away from God in this way. And so when we're bobbing around in this boat, you've got to have the engine engaged and the nose pointed into the waves because the waves of life come, otherwise you start getting choppy. So if you're thinking that Christianity is just something that you can come to every now and again when you're feeling a bit, I promise you, you are drifting towards Babylon. There is no middle ground. Things of water... Another angel of chapter 12 saying, fall into the pit, um, fall and fall into the fire. So this world, we, we did a study in Daniel and a few years ago, and we really dug into what Babylon means. Just think of Babylon as a, as a, a kind of godless cultural worldview of decadence, corruption, moral decay. And so the Bible, again, gives us this kind of choice. You can have springs of living water. That's what the church talks about. Or you can have Babylon. But know this, it's already fallen. Already fallen. It's a really interesting statement. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. He who made all mountains, winter, summer, and winter, and the sun, especially now, as we hear 
was very uh, relevant then in Rome as it is now. Drunk on the wine of Christ, it was actually supposed to be translated madness. That this is this is kind of energy. Jesus says, this isn't just spiritual drunk, you're busy, and if you think that God is drunk, and we've heard the term given kind of drinks in the end too, right, that it's it's not all that great, if you start believing stuff that actually isn't reality, and then he says, the guy from the cult there was drunk, and the, and the truth of the wine is passionate about what's going on in the culture, and yet completely blind to the fact that they're drunk. Here, here's what I'm talking about. Basic common sense says that if you were going to sleep around a lot, that ultimately it's going to end badly for you emotionally, physically, relationally. And yet what does our culture say? Our culture says, no, you do you. You go do you. No judgment at all. Just be you. You know, you swipe right, swipe left, whatever. You go sleep around. You go, girl. Yeah, high five, man. But common sense says that is gonna that's gonna end badly. And then you start looking at what our culture believes that is actually drunk on when it comes to issues of sexuality. It's gonna end badly. Common sense says that. You don't need to be a Bible-believing Christian to know that there's two genders. It's going to be offensive. But common sense says that if we're giving medication to our kids, it's going to end badly. But we're drunk on the idea that this is true. And you can apply it to all sorts of different ways. And so Babylon is falling. And here's what's interesting that's happening in our culture right now. I don't know if you've noticed this, but Britain has already turned the corner of, hang on a minute, all this doesn't make sense. Really? What a shock. So they're actually now kind of going, uh, I think we've made some mistakes about what our worldview and truth is. I'll give you another example. They got very, very excited in Britain about the idea that nativity scenes were incredibly offensive. So they started getting rid of nativity in Christmas. Sound familiar? Let's get rid of them, because it's offensive to people. It's offensive to our minorities, the Sikhs and the Hindus. Guess who it was who were the first people to say that's stupid? The Sikhs and the Hindus and the minorities. So Britain is starting to kind of turn a corner here, and they're thinking that maybe we've been drunk on the wine of our thinking. And they're starting to see it here too. But they're waking up to the fact that the minority of the minority of the minority that have screwed up their lives have found ways to meet with God and say, this is me. Not in Jesus' name. Not in church culture. Now is the year as the rich have fallen. They have fallen prey. Fallen thinking. And so we need to be very careful in our day-to-day actions as to which banner we are maintaining our stance under because the drift is always to the other banner. Sarah and I went to the movies the other night, and we're always very careful as to what movies get promoted in church. When you watch them, you go, oh, oh. But one that we were actually really enjoyed, and because cause I'm old, um, I remember watching when I was a kid, The Fall Guy, and I was like, I want to see The Fall Guy. I was a lean major fan. I, the reason I wanted to be a stuntman when I was 12 was I wanted the job he had. At the time, I wanted the girl that he had. And I wanted to jump off tall buildings. It was great. So I said to Sarah, we should go, I think it was Sarah's idea, let's go see The Fall Guy. She didn't like movies. She just she actually really enjoyed it. And then it occurred to her, there hadn't been anything sexually inappropriate at all. How unusual is that? That you're getting drunk on the wine of Babylon is as getting a primer card to the constant feeding that our culture gives us of things that are immoral. So now you're actually 
surprised you can get through a whole movie where there's not sex in. Do you see my point? Because we've now just been acclimatized to watching things and listening to to things that ultimately are only going to end badly. We've got this wrong panic. Our vision has changed. And Jesus comes and he says, look, there's a different way because the reality is Babylon always leads you to me. Always. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives the mark on his forehead, thinking all you can is that. Standing under the banner of Satan is always what leads to me. And then the sin is what does it to you? It does it to you. Because we're transformed in our thinking. We're transformed in our lives. We're transformed in our habits. And we can stand into the banner that has been thrown at us. That we can actually live in alignment with the way that we've been designed. That we can live in alignment with the way that God in the beginning said, this is the best way to live. And then we move into a part of this psalm which is saying that the consequences of standing under the wrong banner, the banner that says I can do this, the banner that says actually I'm okay with the mark on my forehead and my image, I'm okay with following this path because it will help harm this person. We also will bring the wrong results to our choices and we don't even stop to see that we're moving into an infinite realm and the closer and the presence of the Lamb and the smoke of their torment will rest forever and ever and ever. And it will be the fruit of their bosom and their keeping that will be their eternal life. Day or night will they be in our sight. For who? Who worships the beast who worshipes the image and his image and worships the beast. And when you follow the thinking and the actions and the beliefs of Babylon, you get drunk on the idea that that is true, then this verse tells you what the way to be saved is going to be. This is the way to be saved. What is it? The Bible will save you? There are some people who have to be in the hell and for me it's the finances so you get a second chance I believe to see that because some of them you go through through an annihilationist you don't believe hell is forever or if you are uh, if you are looking for this world the torment goes on forever and ever regardless of where you might land I'm happy I'm not happy but this is where I land but the consequences so here's the important thing Surprises are not the end of it. The surprises are when you are following the truth. The truth is when you die. Because if this verse is true, the problematic of it might be, and we're going to talk about it very briefly, it causes me to pause and say, what does it mean? What do you do with that? What do you do with that? get from it is that surely we need this to make sure that it's true to me, that it's real, it's problematic for me, that I'm not in agreement with God, that it's cruel and full of wrath and judgment. I need to kind of prompt a few observations about wrath and judgment in this psalm. Quite quick. Really quick. Really, really quick. I'm going to make a statement and then I'm going to explain to you what I mean. God is love, therefore he has wrath. An indifferent God is not a loving God. What do I mean by that? So there's been a moment in my life where I've actually felt a great deal of shame over it. And I want to share with you uh, when this happened. This happened just before we moved over to Canada. And we were in uh, Beautiful and we had a, a grill. And I'm talking about the old wind grill. The grill is not so beautiful. But one of the things, there was no fire there, there was a projection that was there. So straight off the hat. Okay, for those of you who use a grill, you know we don't take out more of the high street. And so we were along the high street, and there was pedestrians there. Which everybody understands, you walk on. Pretty basic. So I'm 29 years old, very rich, and I'm in this this bad thing that's called the street. And so we're going along this grill there, and we're walking along this grill street. And this young man decided that he wasn't a pedestrian in a pedestrian stroller. He was going to ride his bike on pedestrian stroller, and he knocked my daughter over, full over, right on her face, immediate scream. And then he rode off. Any of you who are a parent will understand this basic. And in 
different dad and have a loving dad. And I've always felt a bit of shame over this because what happened next was I ran after it. How on earth can I follow you from a ride? I'm going to get you. I am now 100% sure. I was maybe 20 years old. I ran, I ran, I ran. Then I started seeing them. I'd only seen one recently, but didn't think of it. I'm running down the high street, around the corner. We probably ran three, 400 yards by my car. And I ran after this guy. And I gave him a call. I also should have already had it in my mind. I said, there's a police station there. I will drag you there. Or you can come and apologize to me at the airport. And I just gave him a call to say that I'd done it. So I said, okay. I said, I'm going to have to apologize to you because I'm sorry I didn't do it. And I came back and I did it. Now, the reason I felt shame over this, I say I wrote this, I say I wrote this, I said my head, is I think I was functioning as a lost child. You don't do that to me at the airport. But overridingly, as I considered it, hand on heart, he hurt my kid. You don't get away with that. Now, there's the pride kicking in. You can hear that. I'm not saying we should go around chasing after people. So he just finished his story. He decided that he was going to come back and apologize and say, so he walked and found his dad and said, so did I. And he came back and he said he'd lost his brother when he came into the bank. And then I started to get back on his bike. And I'm like, oh, he's mad at me. And I am mad a little bit now. Maybe there's one thing I could have done to help that out. It was the one example I could think of. None of the others were things that I loved and that I was going to do. But if something is hurting your kid or your parent or your loved one, then something rises up. This graph, we looked at this two weeks ago. This is not, and this is where my analogy breaks down, this is not a spontaneous kind of anger. It's a firm, um, firm pushing down of evil constant opposition to what is evil. That's what this graph means. So if we had a God who was not full of wrath, we would actually not have a loving God because it would be a God who doesn't care. That he cares deeply about the way that the world that he's created and the people who are in it are actually affected by evil. So on one hand, was I bad for chasing this guy? Yeah. And this is where I get confused. Was I bad? But was I, would it be bad for me not chasing him? Kind of? Yes. Kind of bad. We, we oppose anything that will hurt other people. Love them. And the other thing is, it doesn't mean hell is all about giving people what they want. This is a, a well-known, and she writes a lot of writing around this. C.S. Lewis talks about this a lot. This is, a, this is something called in the Bible a passive wrath. The Bible is very clear that there are people who reject God and follow Babylon and the thoughts and the thinking of the world, and God honors that decision. God honors that decision. He's just turning over people to what they really want. They, they want his stuff, but not God. He's giving people what they desire. They want the kingdom without the king, as Mark Twain would say. I know how to do life better than God. And so God says, fine, okay, you go. And that's the scriptural truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We love that. It's pure, pure grace. For God did not send his son, this is verse 17, into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. That's wonderful. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Verse 19. Light has come into the world, but people love the darkness instead of the light because of the deeds were evil. So their love of darkness, God is just giving it over to them. The passive wrath of God, that's the doctrine. They exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship these good created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to sinful lust. God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. So this judgment is just handing over, this wrath is just handing over people to, well, this is what you truly desire by your own free will. And over time, God removes himself more and more and more and more. That's what Revelation speaks of in the last few weeks. Verse 
sat on the cloud as long as he could till it got to the earth and the earth was finished. And John 4 verse 35, don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest, as Jesus taught him, I tell you, open your eyes and look to the fields, they are ripe for harvest. In fact, the Lord of the harvest therefore will send out workers into the harvest field. So what this verse is doing, we've kind of gone through, here are the people of God, here are the marks of the people of God. Here's what following Babylon eventually looks like when it's long and forever. Here's, here's the rally cry. This is the call. This is the David standing in front of Goliath asking King Saul, don't we have a reason? Don't we have a cause? Christian friends, we have a reason. We have a cause. And the problem is not people's interest in Christianity. The problem is our lack of energy sharing this eternal gospel. We were joking in the health club about having Jack on the phone to give testimony in Vancouver. Everybody for Vancouver to know that my mother got an organ by heart. I'm sure it really annoyed the school family. You know, and the kids in the wet and having their teacher blowing their horns and it's cramped and then you've got to know it's kind of cool and then you're in band and you've got to go to work and you've got to get dressed and you've got to go to work. It took her a few weeks to get really up to her mom and dad and have that faith and belief in them that said, I truly believe that you're going to do it. So this is where it gets really, really challenging for me. And perhaps for you, friends, are we going to be indifferent? Are we going to be disruptive? Are we going to disrupt the tactics of the enemy when he's working in our lives? Do we tell people about the good news? Do we look at our neighbors and pray for them? Do we walk around our neighborhoods and pray for the houses as we go by? Do we look for ways that we can contend and contextualize the gospel? In Jude, it says um, that we are to contend earnestly for the faith. It's hard work. And then you look through all of Acts and you can see Paul constantly contextualizing, showing people the way that they can come to know Jesus through love and generosity and help and care. But at some point, we have to open our mouths because as we said in Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. If we truly believe that our neighbors were ultimately going to have an eternity into hell, then we don't say anything. to lead with love, we need to lead with hospitality and generosity, but we have to be bold to speak. I promise you, if one of your prayers in the morning is, Lord, show me somebody that I can talk to about you that's going to go to hell, I will promise you it will become the most dangerous prayer of your life, because he will. And then the second prayer, give me the boldness to tell the whole world. This isn't Jesus. This is death. This is where we get the image of death. It's bitter. It's dying. Another angel comes.
for that was kind of here in my area. You see how it starts here from the middle end of Sir Matt Road and the end area of the forest field that is there. And we've heard the loud voices of Ronnie as he starts just to put in the official Bible study text that we may be able to put into place in our lives. So the end of one who's crippled across the earth and down to the great parts of the earth. And through into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press is trodden with Christ's sickness and blood flows from the wine press. The tires are bought with Christ's blood and the horse of the 1500 stages of the end of Sermon on the Mount. So first of all, what we do know from Scripture is any reference of wine, grapes, vineyard, vine, connection to God's people, Israel. John chapter 15, Jesus himself says, I am the vine. So it kind of just changes the lens through which we look at people's lives. It's a special verse. And then there's this clue, verse 5 and 6. For the full wrath of God is about to be poured out. So look at the story here. An answer you can find in Hebrews 13, verse 12. Jesus also suffered outside the city through the Old Testament and also in the New Testament, the places he's not one of these, where they put people who were of disrepute, enemies, um, uh, criminals, the dead, lepers, anybody who was ostracized by society would go outside of the city. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the King of kings, the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, willingly went outside of the city to make people holy through his own blood. How? By taking the full wrath of God. The full wrath of God that you and I fully deserve to place upon our lives, Jesus took it. That's why when I describe my dad's life, I use the phrase of mercy. He poured all of God's wrath upon me in the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's how we're called by God to live. Not as very clear and very visual and strong imagery, but in thought and in action. eternal justice of all who believe, all who are welcome, all who come, all who take communion. This is what we are celebrating. This is our banner. This is what we stand under. This is what we say our identity is found in. It's an action of Christ represented by the blood, the, the, the wine, and the blood, his body broken, his blood shed, so that I can stand under that banner and I can say, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will receive Christ in all the fullness and all the godliness that pertains to him is given to you. Why? So we can take this message into the world. The only reason that we woke up this morning, the one thing that we can't do in heaven is tell our neighbors about Jesus Christ. The job you have, the business you have, the walk that you go on, the bus that you go on, you are going into enemy territory. Some of you might be in the same place. You 
am I the Christian that is gifted to good news is that there can be confession, there can be repentance, and you can come to the table. You may never have stood under the banner of the Lamb. You might be living your whole life under this banner. Can I tell you, you read Revelation 14, you come to the front of the book, and you are read over and over again. Repent. Believe. Confess. Celebrate. Receive. Become faithful in this decision to live under the one recognize that this is no confession at this. There are times when we become running in celebration of what you have done at the table. And there are times that we come with conviction and confession. 